So I'd like to introduce to you Paul Andrews. Paul is Head of Newport University's Centre for Digitally Enhanced Learning and is passionate about e-learning and learning technology. And Paul works alongside staff at the university looking to enhance their learning development um, through the use of digital tools. And he's going to be showcasing to us some of the world's best free online tools for you to help start to build your own toolbox for creating, hopefully, open educational resources. Paul Andrews. Thank you very much. Um, hello. Can you all hear me OK, first of all? Because I'm having a microphone. I'm just kind of projecting. Uh, there? All right. You can all see this OK as well, yeah? Yeah. Lovely. OK. So, um, as Sue says, yeah, my name is Paul Andrews and I am a learning technologist. So, essentially, um, yeah, like as Sue said, my job is I work with uh, an amazing, wonderful team of, of learning technologists um, in this, the Centre for Digital Enhanced Learning at Newport University. And just to put it into context, what we do is we act as consultants for staff and students and external clients. And we say to them, don't worry about the technology, what do you want to do? What learning experiences do you want your students to have? We focus on the pedagogy. We don't run around like Batman with a utility belt, with an iPod, and an iPad, and a laptop, and a thing sponsored by PC World. We don't do any of that kind of stuff. We're all about people and pedagogy and how they interact. When people tell us how they then want the uh, students to experience learning and the pedagogies they want, then and only then do we start thinking about the technologies. We identify the tools and technologies for people, and then we educate, we do not train, we educate people how to use these technologies for themselves. Because I've been doing this for 10 years, and in my experience and in the experience of other academics who've researched this phenomenon, if you're going to truly embed the use of technology into a learning culture, it has to be owned by the academics, by the educators themselves. Otherwise, there is a tendency for it to be bolted on. So we're very much about empowering people so they feel confident and they don't get that fear of, oh, blimey, I'm using this bit of technology, but an expert's done this for me. What happens if a student asks me a question that I don't know? And I'll get that fear that I don't know the answer to the question. So the idea is we're big promoters of calm and cups of tea and biscuits and chats. That's what we're all about. We're about people, essentially. Now, a lot of what we do is done using free and open source tools. So my plan for the next 35 to 45 minutes, we'll see how it goes, is to show you some of these tools that you can use to get involved uh, with open educational resources. Now, there's two things I need to tell you before we get cracking. The first one is, number one, this talk is currently being streamed, uh, streamed, on live, uh, sorry, again, streamed live on the internet. So that means if you do want to interrupt and ask a question, feel free, but you will be broadcast online. I will stop it at the end before there is time for questions. I will stop it at that point, okay? But this bit's being streamed. The second thing is, if you are all Twittered up and you're comfortable and you're at ease with using Twitter, you can contact me. That's my Twitter handle there. If you tweet me a question, I will get back to you at some point later on today. Alternatively, if you want to get in touch with me after this event, please do feel free to do so. Right. Next start. To do this, I'm going to tell you a story. And I want to introduce you to a lecturer called Bob. This is Bob. Bob is a hard-working lecturer. He's an academic. He also has pressure on him these days to do research. Yes. <laughs> he has pressure on him to generate income. It's quite stressful. And this is why Bob has no hair. <laughs> Nothing to do with my poor, poor drawing skills. You picture the scene. It's a Sunday evening. Bob's had a nice weekend. And the phone goes. And it's his boss. And Bob picks up the phone. And his boss says, Bob, I've got a problem. And Bob says, what's that? And his boss says, well, one of your colleagues is sick. We need you to cover a lecture tomorrow morning, first thing. The problem is, Bob, is there are no resources ready-made. You've got to do this thing from scratch. Bob, being the hero that he is, the conscientious academic that he is, says, yep, no problem, I'll sort it. But then he has some choices to make. Choice number one, he can spend all night reinventing the wheel, creating resources, or he can do a slightly smarter thing and get onto the internet and see if there are any resources that have been ready-made that he can just drop in. Now, there are hundreds and hundreds of websites that let you do this. We've seen some of them already this morning. By the way, I thought this morning was fantastic, so I'm hoping I can live up to what's already been done because I was blown away. I want to showcase three of these things uh, to you. The first site you can go onto, and Bob could do this if he wanted to, would be this blog. I'm hoping that everyone in the room is aware of this blog. Yeah, because it's the Lincoln OER blog. If you're not aware of this blog, you might be in the wrong conference. <laughs> Maybe. Right? 
fantastic blog being dutifully maintained by Sue and her colleague. It's brilliant, it's superb. It showcases all the good work that's going on in this particular university with OER stuff. So if you haven't been there before, or maybe or a visitor from outside the institution, check this blog out, it's wonderful. Second thing you could go to if you wanted to is the Learn High website. Now, with Andy sitting in the room, it would be remiss of me not to showcase this fantastic website. It is, it's going to be uh, upgraded soon, isn't it? It's been sub substantially revised, improved, uh, ready for a relaunch in, in September. You heard it from the horse's mouth, folks. It's going to be legendary. Um, <laughs> So essentially, but this blog is a really, really good repository for resources that you can use. You can go on there and you can search by topic or you can browse and there are lots and lots of tools that you can use and ready-made resources to drop into your lectures, your seminars and so on and so forth to embed them in your blog or your VLE. So that's an, it's, a, it's a nice place to go. The third one I'm going to showcase to you, because I know Sue has been promoting its use is the, I can never get it right, it's, it's Joram, isn't it? I can never pronounce it properly. Uh, the, the Joram website. Again, this is a repository where you can go to educators and go to so Bob can go there if he wanted to as well, type in some keywords, get the resources he wants to use, and then use them with his students. The point is this. He's able to do these things, and rather than spending three, four, five hours on a Sunday evening burning the midnight or preparing something, he can get resources together and weave an educational narrative through those resources ready for the next day. Walk into the lecture theatre and be a hero with very little work. So he does that and everyone loves him. And they make Facebook things about him and all sorts of stuff. But then he thinks to himself, well hang on a second, a couple of weeks ago, right, he's happy that he's got all these things, he's good. He thinks to himself, well hang on a second, I'm taking all of this stuff from all these different websites. I can give something back. Because, you see, Bob has been a lecturer for a number of years. He's got lots of resources that he's made himself. He's been squirreling them all away. And they might be saved on a network drive or a USB pen, the digital equivalent of some deep, dark cave. And he thinks, do you know what? I'm going to bring these resources out of the cave and into the sunshine. I'm going to let other people use them. He wants to give something back. The trouble is, he's not a technical expert. He's a well-rounded, normal human being. <laughs> I don't class myself as one of those. Problems. And all of his stuff that he's got so far is predominantly text-based. It's word process stuff. It's PDFs. It's the stuff he's been typing out. And these are, I mean, now, just as I'm going to step back to the narrative just for a second. I was trying to think of a, uh, of a subject I could use without falling foul, because I thought, well, there's going to be lots of experts here on lots of different things. And I thought, what's the safest thing? What's the most innocuous thing I can think of? And kittens sprang to mind. The trouble is I don't know anything about kittens, so in the finest tradition of academia, I went onto Wikipedia and copied and pasted it. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, but I'm allowed to do that under Creative Commons, as it was mentioned this morning. But don't worry so much about this depth of text. Just think of yourself, imagine it's something that you've got, a handout that you've made. But in Bob's position, he basically has this handout here, and it's all text-based, but he wants to give that back. He wants to put it as an open educational resource. So, what I want to do is take you on the journey that Bob would have to go through to make this happen. And the way I see it, it's basically like a production line. So I'm going to start here, and go all the way across <laughs> here, and then something's going to come out at the end. That's the plan. So the first thing Bob needs to do, if he's got his, he's got his, you know, he's got his Word document, he's... He needs to get this thing online, because if you can't get it online, you're kind of stuck. Now, there are loads and loads, I mean, these days, there are loads of different ways to get things online. But I want to showcase to you one free tool that we're using in Newport University, and it's being used all over the world. It's with fantastic results. And that resource is Google Sites. All of these links, by the way, I'm going to show you. You don't have to write them down. There's, there'll be one master link right at the end of this, and there's a web page where they're all on. So feel free to write it down if you want to, but if you don't want to, that's cool. So Google Sites essentially is a free service that's offered by Google, and it lets people create as many websites as they want. And these websites could be online shops, they could be electronic portfolios. Incidentally, that's what we're using for at Newport University at the moment. We're teaching students and staff how to make electronic portfolios using this thing. And the rationale behind that one is that rather than it being something that's owned by the institution, when they graduate, it's still theirs. And in five years' time, it's still theirs, and they can develop it, they take ownership of it. 
But Bob can use Google Sites to essentially create a website which hosts the material that he's going to have. So that's what he does. He signs up. It takes two minutes. Creates a website. And then he copies and pastes the text from the Word document into the Google site, which is what we've got here. This effectively is now an open education resource. It's online, and because it's web-based, it can be viewed on anything that can connect to the internet. That's a mobile phone, a tablet, a computer, a laptop, and a games console. You don't need specialist software like, a, like Microsoft Word to view the notes anymore. And for accessibility purposes, it means that people who use screen readers can access this content as well because they just throw their screen reader at it and it will turn the text into speech. So that's what he does. But then he thinks to himself, well, hang on a second, I've seen these other open educational resources and I know that I can put lots of different kinds of content on here. I can tart it up, I can make it look sexy. So that's what he decides to do. And the first thing he decides to do is to put pictures in it. So, that's the first stage. Stage two, adding images. Now, um, some of the, the presentations we saw this morning talked about uh, image search engines and Creative Commons and all that kind of stuff. I'm going to show you another Creative Commons search engine. In fact, what I'm going to show you is the Creative Commons search engine, run by Creative Commons themselves. As, as um, I think it was uh, Stephen who said this morning about the, the, the whole the Google thing, you know, as, as academics, we kind of we go on to Google Images and we go type, type, type in, boom, we get the images, we go, that'll do, we'll stick that in. But sometimes that will be breaching of copyright. So if you are after royalty-free images that aren't going to get you into trouble, if you use this Creative Commons search engine here, what you do is you put a search term at the top. You can change the kind of uh, license, licensing agreements you're going to have up there. If you want to kind of do boots and braces and make sure you're absolutely watertight, just make sure those two top ones are ticked, and then you're fine. And then all you do is you basically click on any one of these, and it will go away and search. I don't know if you can make it out the back, but it says like you know you've got Google Images, it's Flickr, and OpenClip Art Library. You click on the search engine you want to use, and this Creative Commons search engine will then go away to that particular website, do the search for you, filter all the stuff you're allowed to use, and just give it to you. It's brilliant. So that's what Bob does. He types in the word kittens, and because he's heard of Flickr before, because someone said, oh, Flickr's quite a good website for images, he selects Flickr. And he gets a whole load of images coming back, all licensed for Creative Commons use, and there's hundreds of them. So he scrolls down and scrolls down and scrolls down until he finds one that's suitably serious and represents the true kind of uh, nature of academia within kittens, which is this one here. Ah, oh. oh. <laughs> cute huh? All right. So this is the one he's going to use. Now what he needs to do is he needs to check out the kind of Creative Commons license that he has to uh, stick to. Essentially, I mean, again, this morning we talked a lot about Creative Commons licenses. The thing to remember with Creative Commons is this. As long as you stick to the criteria that the person has set up for Creative Commons, you're okay. And the criteria are normally something along the lines of, you've got to give credit to the person who originally created the image, and if you do decide to edit it, then you have to share what you've edited using the same kind of license. That's, that's pretty much it. But if in doubt, you can click on the Creative Commons license there, which I've, I've uh, kind of put a red box around, and the Creative Commons search engine will then give you the actual license. So it says, look, for this particular image, Bob can copy that, no problem at all. He can make derivative works of it. In other words, he can edit it in some way, shape, or form. He can even use it commercially if he wants to, as long as he does these two things. First one, he's got to give credit to the original author. And by that, we normally mean a hyperlink back to the original author's kind of Flickr profile or something. And if he does edit the photograph for Kitten, he has to share the edited photograph under the same licensing. Hopefully, this isn't scary to anyone, because it's all in kind of plain English. But like I say, if you are in doubt with this stuff, with the Creative Commons stuff, if, um, if you, when you do the search, if you make sure those two little boxes ticks up there, you're watertight, you're golden, you're covered. It's not a problem. So, he's got his kitten, and he's got his license, and he thinks to himself, ooh, I can edit this, I can do something with it. The problem is, Bob is not a graphic artist. The other problem is, he works in a university where the computers are quite locked down, and there isn't a graphics package on the, on the university computers, so you could ask IT to do it, but in, in the nicest way, it might take IT a little bit of time to install the software, and so on and so forth. I'm sure none of you are familiar with the situation. 
I can tell that by the smirks on your faces. Um, so, what he can do, though, is he can use any number of free online image editors. And there are loads of them. But the one I'm going to show you is a site called PicMonkey. Get some water. PicMonkey is a fantastic site. It basically lets you drag and drop images from your desktop or wherever that might be onto this little square here. And then when you've done that, it lets you edit that photograph uh, using a really user-friendly, fairly basic but quite powerful interface. So you can resize images, you can crop them, you can recolor them, you can do all sorts of things with them, you can add text to them, put special effects on them. So that's what Bob does. He basically drags his photograph of his kitten onto PicMonkey, and then he starts using the, the inbuilt, again, it's all web-based, <clears throat> no software to install. He starts using the image editor within his web browser. And so what we've done here is we've got the kitten photograph, we've applied a Polaroid frame to it, and then we've clicked on some text, and we've typed in the word meow underneath. It hasn't been referenced properly, I'm sure, for the academics amongst you. I've <laughs> quotation there. But, but the idea is... <laughs> Don't understand how to reference it, it so much. Um, so, but basically, he, he's done that, and he can edit this photograph, and once he's happy with his edits, he can save this image back to his computer. So that's what he does. And once he's done that, he can stick it in his Google site. So now we have Bob's text and his image. And the thing to draw your attention to is underneath here, because the license said we had to, we've got to credit the original person who took the photograph, with a link back to their Flickr profile, and also, just to cover boots and braces, a hyperlink to the Creative Commons license by which it was used. Yes? Can I just ask, on the Google site, yes. can you actually edit documents in there, or would you have had to have removed the original text-only document, so added the graphic and then re That's a really, really good question. The answer is you edit it live on the page. So if the, the, the nice thing for like an, acad an academic is, you know, every year you might tweak your, your stuff as you go along. You, you just go here, make those changes, and it's done, and it instantly just, just goes through. Excellent question. Thank you very much. So we've got some images. But he doesn't want to stop there. He thinks to himself, well, hang on a second. I've got images. I'm going to put some sound in. Now, if he wants to put some sound in, he's got some options. I'm going to take you through several options, but I'm only going to use one of them. But I just want to make you aware of some of the options that are available to you with, when we're talking about sound. The first one is if Bob or yourselves wanted to add music to his website, or in fact you wanted to add music to a video or a blog or whatever it might be, there are ways and means of using commercial music, uh, legal ways I should add, but um, this here, this is the Free Music Archive. This is basically a web page which contains thousands of tracks that have been licensed for use with Creative Commons. And the quality of them is really good. You know, it's not some dude with a Casio keyboard with a kind of you know, shonky 8 bit thing. You know, it's not like that. It's really, really good stuff. So if you do want backing tracks of things, you may want to have a look at the Free Music, Ar Free Music Archive. It's not the only site out there that does this, but it's certainly one of the best. And because it's got a dedicated page for Creative Commons, it's a nice place to go to for those of you who are in doubt or think, actually, I'd quite like to get a handle on this. Because everything you see on that page is Creative Commons. Alternatively, we could use Audacity. Now I know some of you here are familiar with Audacity because I understand Sue has been promoting its use. And it's, it's Audacity, you can, you can tell how good Audacity is because like I say, I've been doing this for 10 years. Every single e-learning conference I've ever gone to, there is some guy talking about Audacity. And that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing because that kind of speaks volumes the power and versatility of this particular free piece of software. The only downside to Audacity is it's a piece of software that needs to be downloaded. So you can either install it on a USB stick and just run it off the stick on any machine you like, or it needs to be installed somehow on the machine you're currently operating on. Not necessarily a problem, but it's just something to be in mind if you're in a bit of a pickle, if you need to do things quickly. If you do need to do things quickly, though, my recommendation would be you have a look at something called Miner. Miner is a web-based version of Audacity. No download needed. Works from a web browser. Now, the advantage that Miner has over Audacity is this. Miner has a built-in bank of thousands of ready-made jingles and stings and music tracks that you can use royalty-free. So if you want or your students want to make podcasts 
and you want them to sound maybe a little bit more professional than what you've got with Audacity, because although Audacity is quite, it's very powerful, it can sometimes be challenging to get jingles and stuff in. This is a simple menu system. You go, I want that jingle, it just puts it in. It's, it's, I would say for the beginner, it's, you're better off with Audacity, but if you've been using Audacity for a while, this is a, a nice step forward. It can seem quite in intimidating though for the kind of the first time user because it gives you, when you first start a track up, it gives you multi-track, <coughs> uh, multiple layers you can work with. But for those of you that are, comf are comfortable or confident with editing audio on Audacity, this is certainly worth the look. But in my experience, and the example I'm going to use with Bob, that's not what most academics actually want. What they really want is a really simple way of just recording an MP3, maybe a spoken voice. Little podcast, say good morning, how are you doing? This website here will let you do that. It's recordmp3.org. It's really good. You go to the website, you have a microphone, hit record button, you can't really see it inside, there's a record button there, honest. You speak, you hit the stop button, it allows you to save the results in MP3. Job done. No software needed, works from a web browser. So that's what Bob does. He thinks to himself, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this particular website. I'm going to read out the text that I've got on my Google site so that students, if they want to, can listen to it instead. Or they can listen to it on, a, on an iPod or something. And Google Sites lets you do that. So I've recorded my MP3, and I've put a big, a big red box around it just to illustrate where it is. But you basically use Google Sites built-in MP3 player so someone can come to the site, read the text, or hit the play button, and the MP3 will play wherever you've decided to record. It's a very, very nice, quick system to use. By the way, before I continue, is this useful? I kind of... <laughs> okay, I can't tell. Um, but you're not throwing things at me yet, so that's okay. Right, so, so, so far we've looked at how to get things online, and we've looked at how to get images uh, in our, our resource, we've, we've added some audio. The next thing we're going to look at is how you add video. Now again, this morning we saw lots of fantastic projects that have been using, that both students have been creating, staff have been creating their own video, which is brilliant. I'm going to give you some options that you can use to create all sorts of different videos, but then for the purposes of our example, I'm just going to pick one. So the first thing to make you aware of isn't just any old YouTube, it's not like a Marks and Spencer's app, but this isn't just any old YouTube, right? This is an educational YouTube. YouTube forward slash edu, it is their educational channel. And here, what they're basically doing is collecting all the videos to do with education, many of them produced by the world's top universities. And the idea is you can use the search box at the top and it will search just for the educational videos if you want to use them. So if you want to find a video on a particular topic, it's worth a look here, rather than just going to plain old normal YouTube when you, you know, get results like talking cats and stuff like that. But, which for the purposes of this example would be really useful, but yes. No. Now, the, the thing is with the YouTube license is this. With YouTube, if a user has, uh, lets you embed things, then you're okay. Yeah, because you're not saying, this is my video, I've made this. It's, it, and that's basically how YouTube works, because so, otherwise, nobody would ever be able to embed anything from YouTube at all. You'd be in trouble if you said, oh yes, I, you know, if you've got, let's say, um, a talk of Brian Cox, and go, yes, I, I made this, so that, that's not Brian Cox, it's me in a wig. You, you might be in trouble. <laughs> but... No, yeah, absolutely. It's just, it's, it's basically making sure that if you are, I mean, what I tend to do is if I'm using these things, I'll embed the video and I'll just have a title of the video underneath who it's, who it's by with a link back to that thing there, absolutely. But yeah, some of these won't be Creative Commons. Just as a tangent though, if you go to the Creative Commons search engine, YouTube is one of the options on that. So you can say to YouTube, give me the videos back under the Creative Commons license and it will do that for you as well. So you've you know, got options. Good question, thank you very much. The other site where you can go to to get videos is TED.com. You may have heard of TED already, it's quite famous. The TED stands for Technology, Education and Design. It's basically got a whole load of talks by the world's leading thinkers and doers. And if you want videos based on, I say latest research outputs, it can be a little bit outdated, but if you want talks on kind of cutting edge stuff surrounding your particular subject, this is a good place to start looking for stuff. Some of the stuff on here is mind-blowing, it's absolutely brilliant. And again, with the TED stuff, it is licensed under Creative Commons, which means you can edit the video and remix it for your own purposes. But that's finding video. What happens if you want to make some video? We've got a couple of options. 
Now, I, I, mean, I live in Wales, and therefore Wales is a bit of Dr. Quiz and therefore it's obligatory to put anything in the book. I've got now, it's got to be done. YouTube essentially lets you record your own videos straight from the web browser, if you have a YouTube account. All you need is to log on to YouTube and you hit record, and as long as you've got a webcam, you can speak, it will record that video and put it onto YouTube automatically. This means you can create talking head videos, which your students can watch, for, what, 20 quid for webcam, and that's it. And then those videos can be viewed on any kind of web-enabled device, because YouTube looks at everything nowadays, from Xbox 360s through to iPods and computers and so on and so forth. It does have some fairly basic editing features where you can trim stuff down if you want to. Some of our lecturers at Newport University are using this to give feedback to students on their assessment. Because, I could have ooh, that's scary. Well, gone are the days when everything you put on YouTube is available to the public. YouTube has changed the way it handles its videos. Yes, you can make videos publicly available, but you can also make them completely locked down as well. And there's a spectrum in between. It's possible to have a video on YouTube that only certain named people can see. So when that comes into play, it's possible for you to record a video on YouTube and share it with a particular student. That student could choose to share that, that resource with somebody else in the same way that they could choose to share the writing you've put on their essay with somebody else, but the point is, that's their decision. So it's possible to do it that way. I'm not saying you should use this for, you know, like, oh, you must use this to give feedback to students. I'm saying it's an option, it's a possibility. But the important thing is you can use this to make talking head videos if you want to. And you can also use it to get students to give feedback on stuff as well. The other kind of video that's quite popular in education is something called a screencast. Um, give me a nod if you're familiar with the term screencast. Okay. There's, there's not that many people doing that. Okay. Just explain to us, and it's like, I know what a screencast is. Um, <laughs> just explain to us what a screencast is. Essentially, it is a video of your computer screen. All right? So the idea is, normally if you want to show someone how to do something, you've got to sit down next to them and go, right, watch this. And they watch the screen, and you're moving the mouse, and you talk to them, and blah, blah, blah. This allows you to make videos of, like a demo of your computer screen. And whilst you're moving the mouse and typing the keyboard, it's recording everything that's shown on your screen. It's also recording your voice, so you can have a narrative over the top. Therefore, if you need to make videos which show students how to use a particular piece of software, for example, a library catalogue search, you might show them at induction, but they might forget three weeks later, and then come and hassle you again when it's time, mm -hmm. yeah, when it's time for them to actually do the, the essay and stuff. You can make a bank of videos, say to the students, no problem, you can watch these 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There are lots and lots and lots of ways of making screencasts. There are lots of different bits of software. The reason why I'm highlighting screencast-o-matic is because it automatically uploads your videos, if you want to, back to your YouTube channel. So if you have a YouTube account, which incidentally, if you're already using Google sites, you do, because it's all part of the same software suite, then you can create an, ac uh, an account with talking heads and screencasts combined. So it gives you options in terms of how you want to put stuff up. No matter which one of these options you choose, though, you're able, essentially, to embed that video into the website. Now... <laughs> I've killed the sound on this because we're, we're streaming, but uh, essentially, just to show you, there is a soundtrack to this, but, but, but essentially, <laughs> but the reason why I put this is just to show you how it would look like. Essentially, you can embed that video, so on the same page we've got our picture, we've got the sound, we've got the text, and now we have uh, two Jedi kittens fighting out for Battle of the Universe. <laughs> and the Rona gets very, very grumpy with them and tells them that Star Wars is now banned. So I'm going to pause that. You can watch it. It's all... So I just play it till the end. I say, I'll just go, I'll go to the pub and you guys carry on. Um... <laughs> he tells them off and they look all sad. And that's the end of the video. Um... Okay. <laughs> but the point is. The reason why I want to show you that is because it doesn't matter what kind of what the video content is, you can embed it really easily with uh, the Google sites. And uh, in case you're sat there thinking, oh man, like, this is quite technical, it actually works like, I'm going to show my age here, those old kind of um, sticker albums. Now, as a kid, I grew up in the 80s and I used to like Transformers, and I get like the, the stickers of Optimus Prime and Megatron, and you kind of stick them in the, 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 the book, yeah? 
Well, it's kind of like that. So if you base the idea is these are just stickers, and if you want to move them around, you can do. It's very, there's no technical coding. You haven't got to be a code monkey or some kind of IT ninja. It's, it's built for normal people. Just goes, I want that video there. Oh, I don't like it. Then I'm going to move it around there. And what you see is what you get. Yes. Just looking at your YouTube bit on there. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, once now the videos finished, some adverts have come up. Yep. Do you have any control over that? Because I can see all sorts of ethical problems. Uh, with adverts suddenly popping up on your website, you've got no control over what adverts are there. No, no. I mean, because because it's not your. It's, 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 let's say it was. It's not our video. Mm. Then no, because it's, it's a service offered by Google. Now, just to explain with this, the adverts look worse than they are on here because I'm using Prezi. If you were to have a normal, if I actually did this live on the site, the adverts are much smaller. But no, I mean that's how Google makes their money essentially. Um, so that, that is something to consider. However, um, you know, if you were to say to a student, go and watch this video on YouTube anyway. There's adverts on there anyway, so it, it is something to weigh up. But the answer to that is no, you, you, you wouldn't be able to turn the adverts off, unfortunately. Good question. <laughs> I don't think Ted has adverts though. So, you know. Okay. So that's video. Two more to go. Next thing I want to look at is PowerPoints. We saw this morning when, with uh, the chemistry project, people were using um, SlideShare, and I'll come on to that in a second. If you want to, let's say Bob has some PowerPoints he wants to use, and he wants to embed these PowerPoints into his Google site. The easiest way that he can do this is by using Google Docs. Well, Google Docs essentially, Google Docs does a lot of stuff, but for the purposes of this talk, what you can do with it is take a PowerPoint, chuck it into Google Docs, it will turn it into a web-based format that can be viewed on any online-enabled device without the need to download PowerPoint. That can then, the presentation can then be edit, um, embedded into your site. The nice part is, and to go back to the other question we had earlier, if you then need to edit that PowerPoint, you can edit it live on Google Docs and the changes will cascade through automatically. So you don't need to go back to PowerPoint and re-edit it and re-upload it and faff about. So you can do it that way if you want to. The other thing I want to make you aware of is, again, we, SlideShare was kind of highlighted this morning. So essentially, for those of you who aren't familiar with SlideShare, it's just a website, a bit like YouTube, but it's for PowerPoint slides, essentially. And people can just put their PowerPoints up there, and you can too. And then when you upload PowerPoints, you can give people the ability to uh, embed them into various websites. So for the purposes of this demonstration, that's what, uh, that's what we're going to do. So if you said Bob thinks, well, hang on, I need a PowerPoint slide. So he, he does a search for kittens, and the search results comes up. There, there are more, than I've just got four here, but there are loads and loads and loads of them. He can then preview the one he wants, that one, and flick through that, and he thinks, actually, that will, that will work really well because I've actually, I want a page on my Google site that's going to talk about birth and development. So what we've now got here is, rather than everything just being on the one page of the Google site, because originally in the document, it's one big document, we've now broken this document up into two bits. One page has the video and the kitten go meow and the sound and all that kind of stuff. But there's another page now that has just the section about birth and development. And this means the students and the users can choose, using the navigation system we've got over here, which bit they want to look at. Now, for the, for the technically confident amongst you, you can tweak this navigation menu to your heart's content. But for those of you who don't want to get involved in any of that nonsense, it will build this automatically for you. You just say, I want a new page. You get a new page, and that new page will appear in the navigation menu. There's no technical ability needed to make this thing work. Almost there. So, last thing. Assessment. It's quite tricky um, to do assessment with OER because, in all honesty, if you're using... You've got the Blackboard in Lincoln. Yeah? Blackboard. Some people use Moodle, some people use Blackboard. If you've got a VLE that does assessment, then my honest recommendation is always use that if you want to engage with um, online assessment in some way, shape, or form. But if you're pushing something out there, you don't know if it's an OER thing, you don't know if that person who's going to be using it at the other end has Moodle or a Blackboard or whatever it might be. So it can be quite tricky. So one possible way around this is by essentially using little games to test people's knowledge and understanding. For the academics amongst you, the term to search on you know, Google Scholar is something called gamification. It's basically a study of how education and concepts can be taught via the use of games. Nobody even put wake up screen. There we go. 
Now, making games can seem quite daunting because this whole kind of like, you know, degree program is about how you make games. So, there is a website though called classtools.net. Lovely website, and it lets you basically, it has a load of templates you can use, and you can create various sort of interactive activities and games which can be embedded in your resource. So, I just come back, it's got an arcade game generator which I've circled in, I've put a little red square around it there. This is the arcade game generator, and uh, basically all you do is you put some questions in, and you do the last of it, you put the answer in, and you give your, your quiz a name, and then you choose from a number of templates. Now, because Bob was a child of the 80s, there's one template that caught his eye. That's the ability to make an online version of Manic Mining. <laughs> Those of you that are laughing and know exactly how old you are. Um, <laughs> So if you grew up with experiencing the joys of the Spectrum 48K and a rubber keyboard and the Commodore 64 and a temperamental tape drive, you'll know exactly what this is. This is a, a, a seminal video game, but for the purposes of kind of teaching people how to, uh, how to kind of understand things or remember things, it functions a little bit different to the original game as you remember it. This person here is called Minor Willy. Yes, that is his real name. The 80s were a simpler, more innocent time, what can I say? Um, and essentially, what happens is the questions you put in the question bank appear here at random. I'm not, I don't know what the maximum number of questions is to be honest, I've never actually maxed it out. But you can, you can put the questions in. And then what happens is the, it'll pick, from the questions, it'll pick three random answers from that question bank, and they kind of float around, and then you have to guide mine and William jump into the right answer. After you've collected three, the key will unlock, and then a toilet will appear, and you can jump down the toilet to the next level. I kid you not. <laughs> the 80s were a wonderful time. But this is just one of the many templates that you can use. And we actually use this at Newport University. We had um, the inspectors were coming in. And we had to teach our staff lots of different acronyms, because we knew that the inspectors were going to come in and ask them, what, you know. And we had like a development day, and we went for the PowerPoints and blah, blah, blah. But then we created a little arcade gallery for them to, to play around with, essentially, that would let them in a hopefully not too um, disturbing way, uh, reinforce what had been done on the day by asking them questions. Some staff loved it, some staff hated it. But, you know, again, the message we give to all of our, all of our educators is this. You know what's appropriate for your students. And if you think that's going to work for them, then fantastic. But if you think, actually, no, 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 then don't use it. Okay, this is just an option. So, that's the process. I started out by saying I wanted to tell you a story about Bob. Bob, who started out by finding some resources online and then he wanted to give something back by following through this process here, using free online tools. The total amount of time it took to start from the text through to the end, in some total, was around about two and a half hours from start to finish. Hopefully, that's not too onerous. The end result is here. And the end result isn't just something I've been making up. It's a real website that you can actually go and play if you want to right now. This is the web address. Bitly, forward slash, Lincoln Kittens. If you go there, you'll go and see that you can experience the website and have a go and play Bandit Mining, jump down the toilet and watch the Jedi Kittens and do all the things I've been showing you. There's one last thing I just want to uh, show you, and this is why I like Google Sites so much. <coughs> This is the finished site. I've changed it ever so slightly now. Rather than having the, 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 the menu uh, coming down the left-hand side, we've got tabs going across the top. And there's a reason for this. I get asked almost on a weekly basis if I can make mobile apps. Every week someone says, can you get an app for the iPod? I, iPod? I'm like, no, I'm busy. I think so do. Google Sites, though, will detect if the person looking at the site is using a mobile phone. And if they are using a mobile phone, it will automatically adjust the content to fit on a mobile screen. phone screen. This is a screenshot of, of the Lincoln Kittens website on my iPod. And this is why I had the tabs in, because the tabs work better on a small screen. It allows people to click on it and go to the various devices. So by using Google Sites, you can, in effect, make your own free mobile apps, which also work on a games console, a tablet computer, and a PC. And they will adjust their look and feel accordingly. So that's my presentation. That's what I wanted to take you through. The thing is, I want to leave you with just one thing. All of these things I've shown you here, they, they're, they're just some of the, the resources and tools that you can use. There's hundreds and hundreds of these, these 
websites and resources are out there. But more importantly than that, there are thousands of educators out there right now lurking on places like LinkedIn and Twitter and the Blackboard user forums who are ready, willing and able to help and support you. They're normal, well-balanced individuals just like you. They don't speak geek, they're normal people, but they will help you and they will share their experiences with you. And hopefully their resources too. What I'm trying to say to you is that this is just the tip of the iceberg. It is literally just the beginning. And if you want to see all the resources I've been talking about today, if you put your web browsers to bit.ly forward slash open Lincoln, everything is there for you. And ladies and gentlemen, it's been an absolute pleasure. If you've got any questions, I'd be more than happy to take them now. Thank you very much indeed.